No matter who's been in the Oval Office over the years, Britain boasts of what it calls the special relationship with the United States. With Brexit Britain looming, can it expect any kind of special treatment from Joe Biden? This is Roundtable. Hello and welcome from me, David Foster. How high up the president-elect's priority list is the UK? Is it even there at all? Boris Johnson must be hoping so. New Britain, new president. How's it going to work? US president-elect Joe Biden's added to the pressure on Britain's prime minister to strike a post-Brexit trade deal with the European Union. Negotiations between the UK and Brussels have entered what could be their final few days. Joe Biden, an Irish-American, has said that any deal has to be contingent on respect for the Good Friday Agreement. That treaty to bring peace to Northern Ireland in 1998 guarantees an open border with the Republic of Ireland. And that guarantee was central to the UK's divorce agreement with the EU last year. But the UK government has threatened to go back on it and break international law. The EU has thanked Joe Biden for what they called his clear support in the dispute with Britain. And the UK government knows that after Brexit is concluded, a trade deal with the US will be a priority. So how influential is the US president-elect when it comes to the crucial decisions in the UK-EU talks? And what happens afterwards? Well, I'm very pleased to say that we can welcome to this roundtable Russell Foster, lecturer in British and European politics at King's College London. Good to have you back, Russell. Professor Amelia Hadfield is with us. She's in Guildford in the UK, head of the Department of Politics at Surrey University and the director of the Centre for Britain and Europe. And we say hello also to Jennifer Cassidy, former Irish diplomat and lecturer in politics at the University of Oxford. Um, Russell, let me come to you first of all, but this is a question for each and every one of you. What's at stake here, a good relationship between the US and the UK? Well, the relationship between the British and the Americans for the last four years has been uh, somewhat fraught because Britain has spent the last uh, 70 years since the end of the Second World War trying to act as the, the transatlantic bridge between North America and the emerging uh, European economic community, then the European Union. Now, the last four years of the Brexit process have seen that um, being challenged not only by Britain's internal squabbles over Brexit, but also by the election of a president who was not very much of a foreign policy president, much more of a domestic policies president uh, in the form of Donald Trump. Now that Biden's coming in and Brexit is about to happen, what's at stake is not only um, Britain getting a deal uh, which does not invalidate the Good Friday Agreement, which is something that President-elect Biden is very passionate about, um, but also trying to rebuild the transatlantic relationship with a Europe that is very tired of the United Kingdom and a United States which has got um, bigger issues elsewhere in the world uh, than Europe. Jennifer, we'll come to you about the Good Friday Agreement in just a moment because you have a particular interest uh, being from Ireland. But, Amelia, let me ask you... Um, What's at stake here, but much more, I would imagine, for the UK uh, than the US? Yes, absolutely. I mean, to some degree, it's a complete recalibration of, of the United Kingdom in a way that's really quite rare in international relations. You, you don't get these major epochal shifts. And yet, I think, ironically, with Biden coming in, it's a bit like buses, nothing for, for ages, and then two or three come along at once. So for the UK, I think, um, looking east, obviously, it's fundamentally remaking its relationship with the European Union on a whole host of areas, climate change, trade, uh, regulations, environmental standards, and foreign and security policy. Um, and then, of course, um, looking west, it's trying to figure out whether they retain that special relationship, which I think to some extent perhaps means more to Britain than it does to the United States. Um, and also, I think trying to reboot what could have been a, a bit of an acrimonious relationship personally between Prime Minister Johnson um, and President-elect Biden. So there are personalities at work, there's positions at work, and there's sort of roles at work altogether. Well, I wasn't going to mention this just now, but since you bring it up, I will. Has Boris Johnson uh, made mistakes in his uh, time of getting to know Joe Biden before he became president-elect? 
he has, I'm afraid to say it. I, I, I think his sometimes slightly um, cavalier approach to um, rhetorical flourishes, perhaps, if I can put it this way, has landed him in hot water. Uh, I, I think he's. It's it's well known that he wasn't uh, personally rather nice about uh, Biden or indeed uh, Hillary Clinton, um, and I think that went down poorly and has been remembered um, in 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 the Biden camp. So I think there there is a bit of making up to do. Equally, it didn't arise in the phone call between uh, the two um, when when that happened after uh, President uh, elect Biden decided to do the, the phone calls around. So uh, I think they're both very pragmatic uh, gentlemen, and they know very much, I think, what is at stake. But my sense is that Johnson has to do some heavy lifting exactly on the point that Russell made before. Um, there, the, the United States is very, very clear what's at stake with regards to the um, the Good Friday Agreement, they aren't happy with regards to Brexit, at least Biden himself isn't. So I, I think it's up to the United Kingdom now to clarify um, the reasons behind Brexit and to make a success of it in the eyes of the US, which is a tough call. OK, Jennifer, since you are from Ireland and you have familial connections uh, with the area from which Joe Biden um, traces his ancestors, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what Joe Biden thinks about the Good Friday Agreement, how it would work when it comes to the European Union, and particularly with regard to the UK? Well, I, I certainly would agree that when we're looking at the UK, this is a recalibration, uh, as was stated previously. But the fear from the Republic of Ireland, indeed, and Northern Ireland, is actually a reversion to what we have seen um, in the historical past and particularly in the troubles of, of the 70s. And with the slogans that we saw Brexit based on, and indeed the last four years of negotiations based on, such as take back control, for, for colonized nations or nations which are still under the domain of the United Kingdom, these are not words that um, echo very, very fondly um, in the echo chambers or the policymakers of the Republic of Ireland. However, with the Biden presidency, although we can take nothing for granted, as we've seen in the last four years and indeed the last year, we the Republic of Ireland is now confident that we have a strong ally with the president-elect Biden and the, his commitment to the Good Friday Agreement. And while talks remain still up in the air, we're, we're very, very happy. We're very confident going forward. But if there is a no-deal Brexit and if Boris Johnson follows through with his threat to ignore all rules when it comes to Ireland um, uh, as relating to the European Union, what kind of stick does Joe Biden have, Jennifer, to beat Boris with, to make him comply? The prospect of a no trade deal. And while I think the United Kingdom has operated under the premise to date with Brexit that they are of the same power and of the same standing as what we have seen in the Trump presidency, i.e. when uh, Trump pull, pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord and the Iran deal, all he faced really was media backlash and not actually hard power backlash because no one can afford to have these trade backlashes with the United States. But I do believe that the UK is coming to a reckoning that they are seeing that they actually can't operate like that and that their actions do have consequences. So we have seen Nancy Pelosi, we have seen the leader of Congress, we have seen both the Irish and American caucuses, Republican and Democrats, say if there is a return to a hard border and if you are breaking the Good Friday Agreement, even if it is, to quote the Conservatives, in a specific and limited way, there will be absolutely no trade deal. So we in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland are taking Biden and indeed the Congress at their word, and that is the leverage that the Biden presidency holds over the UK. OK, let, let's kick this one around. Go back to you, Russell, but it's open to any one of you at any, any time. Um, Jennifer mentions the trade agreement. How much is it vital for the UK to get a trade agreement with the United States and vice versa? Does the US need a trade deal with the UK or is it OK with the EU? We'll go into difficulties it had with the EU uh, over the last few years in just a moment. But who needs who the most? Britain is very much the junior partner uh, in these upcoming negotiations. The European Union is the largest uh, free market and the largest trading bloc 
in the world, and Britain is a bit of a pipsqueak for them. The United States is still the largest national economy in the world, so Britain find, finds itself caught between two enormous economies which are more interested in trading with one another and frankly don't need the British. So uh, a no-deal scenario is now a, a, would now be a double disaster because it would alienate Britain from the European Union and alienate Britain from the United States. So while this would be catastrophic, it does for me indicate that there isn't going to be a no deal, that a deal will be stuck because otherwise Britain finds itself begging for a trade deal uh, from two economic superpowers, which frankly do not need. British. And yet it's not just trade, is it? It's security cooperation. And Britain has a, a very well respected security apparatus. The United States has relied on that in, in the past, and it's had its disagreements with the European Union. So the United States is not going to cut off its nose here just to spite its face, surely? Well, of course, there's still um, a very deep historical and symbolic uh, relationship between the UK and the USA, and we can look at cooperation in things like security and defence uh, of the UK and the USA cooperating within NATO, within the United Nations Security Council, with intelligence sharing. But of course, the legacy of the global war on terror um, from the early part of this century has meant that America is pulling back from um, being an interventionist power and getting involved in, uh, in international security affairs. So this isn't going to be, um, a, you know, a, as you say, cutting off uh, America's nose to spite its face just in order to, uh, to spite the British. But we've got to be careful about not overestimating the significance of Britain's security relationship and a special relationship which has been becoming more and more distant since the end of the Cold War. It's not the same uh, world as the late 20th century and Britain's uh, assistance to the United States in terms of like, security and intelligence is increasingly um, declining. Amelia, shall we go into trade and uh, chlorinated chicken? It was bound to come up at some point and I, that is not a pun. <laughs> it is a pun. <laughs> chlorinated chicken is uh, very uh, unwelcome, I think, on 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 this side of the pond, um, and it's something I think that the UK has been very staunchly against and has had a hard time working into the the narrative of what could constitute um, a, a relationship, a trade based relationship, at least with the United States. It's funny how these these are sort of totemic issues, which when they get thrown into the mix, are are strong enough, I think, to to slam the brakes on what could up until that point have been. A, you know, a decent agreement. I think I think Russell's right. At this point, really, the UK needs to be focusing on landing that EU free trade um, uh, agreement because it's its largest trade partner. Um, and I, I think that you know the the temperature now from from Brussels is is a lot more um, sort of charitable. I, I think possibly because they're running out of time as as, as fast as the UK is. Um, and the, the sense is that if they can land this deal, um, perhaps they can work in a rather more pragmatic way with the United States. I'm not altogether convinced that the UK actually needs a free trade deal uh, with the US. It hasn't had one necessarily uh, before. Um, it's it's seen to some degree some of the benefits of being part of the European Union when the EU signed a degree with Canada. And the, can, can, the Canadians, of course, and I speak as a Canadian and a Brit together, um, have overhauled their own relationship with Mexico and the United States, effectively NAFTA 2.0. Um, so I think the jury is out to some degree on the material trade-based benefits that uh, US-UK uh, deal would bring. Um, and, and, and I think that the emphasis is rather more on retaining that uh, foreign and security relationship of, of which the special relationship itself, I think, is so important. But I, again, I think Russell's right on this. It has eroded. It's shifted. It's it shifted emphasis. Uh, to some extent, this is bad for the, the United Kingdom because it's it's lost this sort of the, the big brother uh, sort of reliable partner in the United States. But on the other hand, if the U.S. truly is you know, drawing back on the uh, war on terror um, as sort of components that we've relied upon. This may provide um, areas of genuine opportunity for the United Kingdom. And I, I think it has been quite solicitous in, in finding those niche areas and particularly trying to provide these as great examples to the British public of ways in which Brexit can genuinely work on the international stage, not just on the domestic stage as well. Jennifer, your thoughts on what you've heard in the last couple of minutes. But first, I'm going to read something that Joe Biden said a couple of years ago about the UK. Uh, from the US perspective, US interests are diminished with Great Britain not being an integral part of Europe and being able to bring influence. And I'm wondering if that means that 
uh, with Brexit, the United States is no longer particularly interested in the United Kingdom or that the United States feels that it's actually losing a vital ally and ears and eyes on Europe for it. So I, I feel like we're almost all agreeing here um, with my, my fellow panelists. Certainly, I think while the US does see that the, there is a changing relationship with, with the UK and perhaps it doesn't need it as much, I do fully stand with what's been said as regarding a deal, saying that it is in absolutely no one's interests, be it the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, the EU, the US, it is in no one's interests for a no deal to happen. And indeed, sides are softening. However, we are seeing the issue of fish being linked to political sovereignty, but that's something we can discuss um, in a moment regarding the last week of, of negotiations. However, well, I think we'll leave the Brexit talks to one side, if you don't yeah, mind. We've done yeah. so many programmes on them. I'm talking about yeah. two characters, two international characters here, so, the US and the UK. So Biden has been a key advocate of European integration since the beginning. And indeed, one of his talks in on Chatham House before he became president-elect, he openly said that if he was a British citizen, he would not have voted for Brexit. Now, with that said... The US, of course, should not be having an influence or too much leverage on whether a country decides to remain or not remain in a regional bloc. That is just basic diplomacy that is regarding Article 42 of the Vienna Convention. However, well, well, I, I come back what to I'm the trying to say, if you don't mind me interrupting. Sorry, yeah, if, no, if you don't please. mind me interrupting, what I'm trying... What I'm perhaps trying to get at is whether the U.S. Um, feels it's losing a valuable partner in Europe and it's very sorry for what it might not get in the future or whether it's sort of saying, OK, UK, we don't have any interest in you because you're not central to Europe any longer. So I, I don't think there is a strong answer for that saying yes or no. I do agree that the UK has been very much diminished in terms of its benefits to the US in security and defence. And it's not this special relationship that we once saw post-World War II during the Cold War. So I do think the US at this moment in time would not see it as losing as much as it historically once, wa once would have lost with a partner in the UK. However, it's still in their interest to, to maintain this regarding trade and regarding security and defence, but not to the degree that I believe okay. uh, British policymakers are perhaps negotiating under the premise of. OK, I, I, I get that. That's, that's fascinating. And what I wanted to ask, and this is for each and every one of you, Russell, I'll come to you on this one. Is there a shared common interest that goes beyond um, trade and security when it comes to um, the two countries? Um, I suppose, coincidentally, one thing that we didn't anticipate is that both the USA and the UK have got a common desire to rebuild their reputations internationally. So the Trump presidency was quite damaging um, for America's international reputation. And Biden has portrayed himself again and again as a very staunch advocate of the liberal rules based international order uh, of you know, the international law system that emerged after um, the Second World War. He wants to um, to make America's reputation great again, um, to, to borrow Trump's phrase. And of course, the UK needs to rebuild its reputation, uh, especially after Boris Johnson um, almost reneged on the oven-ready Brexit deal. Um, he needs to consider that Britain needs a good working relationship with our closest trade partner, the, United, uh, the European Union, and also our although unequal special relationship with the USA. So both countries want to uh, want to look good on the international stage and they have a shared desire in doing that. OK, so let's take that one stage further. Amelia and, and you, Jennifer, um, a rules based international order wanted by the United States. Boris Johnson doesn't like rules. <laughs> He's not great with rules, but I think he can see the benefit of them. Um, Biden, I think, he's very clear. I think he understands the global risks 
um, of defunding American diplomacy, if I can put it like this, um, in in a very uh, important article published in Foreign Affairs not so long ago, um, he said clearly he was determined to elevate uh, diplomacy as the United States' principal tool of diplomacy. And he described this interestingly. He just defined it as the building and the tending, the nourishing, if you like, of relationships um, and working to identify allies, working to identify areas of, of, of common interest um, while managing points of conflict. So the 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 entire tone, the narrative is, 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 is wholly, wholly different. And I think some of his suggestions, um, exactly as Russell said, is it's recrafting that identity uh, to place the United States firmly back, not just in the rules-based system, but I think at the head of the table. Uh, in a position to work with allies and partners. And that is, that's likely to go down well. Um, at the same time, he's coming out of post-Trump United States. And I, I don't think we should underestimate how difficult it's going to be to pull past that division um, and that uh, really toxic polarity um, that, that we've seen. So he's going to have to still um, push some of those themes, not just not necessarily, um, you know, America first, but um, making sure that America's mm. interests, America's values continue uh, to dominate abroad, if not predominate. So what he needs to do is slightly find a couple of areas like democracy or the, the fight against um, corruption, because that can play well, I think, to the home audience whom he's very keen on cultivating and recultivating um, and the global audience who are sitting on the sides, listening, waiting to hear it. Jennifer, Jennifer, let's talk about their characters, if we may. Mm. And would you care to speculate in what way each one, either Joe Biden or Boris Johnson, can burnish the other's reputation or perhaps rub them up the wrong way? I think there is huge damage to be done if Boris Johnson continues on the track he is on. And I would agree with the point that both of them be it in a post-Brexit era or a post-Trump era, that there needs to be a, let's just say, a PR campaign for both countries um, to emerge. There has been extreme reputational damage done to the UK during, the, during Brexit and the US during the uh, Trump presidency. However, regarding the characters, what we're now seeing and what we will see when President-elect Biden comes in after his inauguration is not that the US is in any way on a clean slate, but they are certainly more um, reliable to other partners now compared to the continuous um, nature we've seen with the Conservatives in power. So regarding our trust in the leaders, I think a lot of allies will very much build a relationship faster and quicker with Biden and distrust the Conservatives and Boris Johnson a lot more simply based on their historical actions. So I think either can both of them, if they don't get along, and we've seen Boris Johnson's comments regarding President-elect Biden um, and indeed the uh, Democratic Party Previously, I think he himself has some reputational um, makeup to do um, with the Democrats and the incoming um, uh, president-elect. Quick final thoughts, Russell, then Amelia. Russell, you first. Are they going to be bosom buddies like Blair and Bush? No, they're not, uh, because I don't believe that Boris Johnson is still going to be prime minister for the duration of um, Joe Biden's term. So in a year's time, we may be talking about um, Prime Minister Sunak and President Harris and their relationship. Amelia, what do you think? Wow, Potential that's a really to get bad. along or is it going to be as short term as perhaps Russell suggests? <laughs> that's quite a radical vision, actually. I'd enjoy seeing that one. I think at this point, the, the main worry for Biden is he can't predict what Johnson's going to do next. If he He's a free agent from a sort of trade-based perspective, even if he does get that EU one signed. But if he goes rogue and starts making deals uh, with China, for example, that undercut uh, what Biden basically wants to do in terms of taking the US in a particular direction, it's going to be very difficult. I think they stand a greater chance of rubbing each other up the wrong way, even if they're making nice in the Security Council. Quick one, Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind, are they going to sort out the Irish question between them? I very much hope so. In the name of peace in for the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, I could not wish for anything more, whether I like Boris Johnson or not, whether I like President Biden or not, I would wish in the name of peace and security on the island of Ireland for both the Prime Minister of the UK 
and the president-elect, soon to be president of the United States, to very much get along, trade to be a deal to be got, and we can all breathe again. A bit more time than I thought, so one more for you, Russell. Does the UK-US relationship really matter anymore? Yes, it does still matter, because if we think about, um, you know, the big challenges that are facing the countries of the world today, um, you know, migration, climate change, cross-border terrorism, these sorts of things are not dealt with at an EU level. So the uh, Brexit process doesn't really matter in that regard. They're dealt with by states. And so um, there's still going to be a need for a strong transatlantic relationship, not just between Washington and London, but between Washington and Brussels and the capitals of Europe. Uh, for states to work together to combat the challenges that are going to face us this century. You've all been very kind to be with us and you have all been very interesting. Great to have you on the programme. Uh, from me, David Foster, that is all we have time for. Wherever you happen to be watching this, we thank you very much for your company. Do join us next time, if you can. Until then, please stay safe. Goodbye.